the definition given by the Parapsychological Association. And for any of you who aren't familiar with the Parapsychological Association, uh, it describes itself as the international professional organisation of scientists and scholars engaged in the study of psi, or psychic experiences, such as telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis, psychic healing and precognition. Uh, and I have to say, as someone who's been interested in this area for a long time, that the Parapsychological Association is certainly the most academically respectable um, organisation that, that, that deals with these kinds of issues. Um, it was, it's affiliated to the American Association for the Advancement of Science since 1969. That was a decision that caused lots of controversy, as you might imagine. Uh, and the Journal of Parapsychology is their publication. And they include in the journal sometimes a glossary with various definitions. So this is how they define paranormal. It's the term for any phenomenon that in one or more respects exceeds the limits of what's deemed physically possible according to current scientific assumptions. They define parapsychology as the scientific study of certain paranormal or ostensibly paranormal phenomena in particular, ESP, that's extrasensory perception, and PK, psychokinesis. And most parapsychologists will also include uh, evidence relating to the possibility of life after death. So, just to give you a few further definitions before we get to the meat of the talk, extrasensory perception is defined as knowledge of or a response to an external event or influence not apprehended through known sensory channels. And it comes in three different varieties. That's telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition. Telepathy is the alleged ability to transfer thoughts between two people or between a person and an animal. Clairvoyance is awareness of remote objects and events, the kind of things that psychic detectives claim they can do by telling people where the missing body will be found or who did the murder and so on and so forth. And finally, precognition, knowledge of events before they occur. So that's ESP, extrasensory perception, that's the sensory side of paranormal abilities. Psychokinesis, PK, is the influence of mind on external objects or processes without the mediation of known physical energies or forces. So anybody who claims that they can actually influence the outside world just by sheer willpower that would be psychokinesis. And sometimes these days you'll come across the term psi, just PSI, and that's a general term used to identify a person's extrasensory motor, ex, sorry, extrasensory motor communication with the environment. In other words, that covers both ESP and PK. Now, the strict definition of the paranormal that is preferred by many academic parapsychologists only includes ESP, PK, and evidence relating to life after death. Uh, but of course, often the word paranormal is used to describe a much wider range of phenomena. So, what about alien abduction claims, or UFOs in general, which are often considered to, to be a paranormal phenomenon by the general public and by the media? Um, the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, uh, religious beliefs, do they come under parapsychology, do they come under the paranormal? Uh, various New Age beliefs, like palm reading, other forms of divination. Traditional superstitions, like it being unlucky to walk under ladders, or black cats being either unlucky or lucky, depending on which country you live in. Um, there are lots of other examples. I'm not going to read that entire list, but that's just a few of them. So for, for the media, for the general public, and I have to say for anomalistic psychologists, the paranormal is basically anything weird. Anything weird and wonderful comes under that general umbrella term. So, as I say, parapsychologists typically restrict themselves to the study of ESP, PK, and life after death. Anomalistic psychologists, the media, and the general public tend to equate paranormal with anything weird and wonderful. Now, I, I think there's a good justification for anomalistic psychologists to do this, just because very often the psychological processes that are involved in some phenomenon which would come under this strict definition, let's say for example mediums who claim that they can talk to, communicate with the spirits of the dead, that would clearly come under the definition of the paranormal used by uh, parapsychologists, whereas astrology would not. 
And yet, if you go for a reading with a medium, or if you go for a reading with an astrologer, you'll actually get very, very similar kinds of information, and it's very likely that the underlying psychological processes are very similar. Um, so, to give you a kind of more formal definition of anomalistic psychology, anomalistic psychology attempts to explain paranormal and related beliefs and ostensibly paranormal experiences in terms of known or knowable psychological and physical factors. It's directed at understanding bizarre experiences that many people have without assuming that there is anything paranormal involved. While psychology, neurology and other scientific disciplines are rich with explanatory models for human experiences of many kinds, these models are rarely extrapolated to attempt to explain strange and unusual experiences. So, I do still sometimes come across the attitude, not as much as I used to, but sometimes still come across the attitude from some colleagues who say, why are you interested in this stuff? We all know it's nonsense. We all know that people aren't really being abducted by aliens. We all know that telepathy doesn't really exist. We all know that astrology is rubbish, etc., etc. Now, whether or not they are right, I think that is not an open-minded scientific attitude. Maybe they are right, but we need to actually kind of keep an open mind for the possibility that some of these claims might turn out to be true. If I had to bet, my personal opinion is that paranormal forces don't exist, but I might be wrong about that, and I'm open to the possibility that new evidence might come along that will make me change my mind. Um, but more important than that, for a psychologist, what is undeniable is that many, many people do believe in this stuff and make important decisions on the basis of those beliefs. Um, and furthermore, a sizable minority of the population actually claim to have had direct personal experience of the paranormal. And therefore, it's an important part of the human experience. So, we as psychologists need to have something to say about that. Now, just to illustrate that point, if we look at opinion polls, uh, this is a typical opinion poll from uh, a survey of over a thousand American adults back in 2005, and around three quarters endorsed at least one paranormal belief. Uh, we look at the, the details there. Extrasensory perception, 41% said they believed in it. 37% uh, said they believed in houses. 32% in ghosts. That's quite interesting because it means that 5% believe in haunted houses that don't have ghosts in them. So that's a bit weird. 31% um, telepathy, 26% clairvoyance, 25% uh, astrology, 21% communication with the dead, and so on and so forth. Um, Similarly, from um, a British poll back in 1998, 64% uh, believe that some people have powers that cannot be explained by science. The figures in square brackets indicate the percentage who claim they have had direct personal experience of whatever the item is about. Now, that is 1% more than believing God. Um, about half believe in life after death about half believe in ghosts, about half believe in precognitive dreams, heaven. Um, interestingly, only 28% believe in hell. Uh, <laughs> uh, about half believe in thought reading, 41% in communication with the dead, about a third believe in psychokinesis, and about a quarter believe in angels and reincarnation. And this is British adults. So these beliefs are very, very widespread. Um, so, uh, there's something here that needs to be explained. There's something there that is a challenge to psychologists. It might be the case that maybe paranormal forces really do exist, that some of these experiences that people have genuinely are beyond explanation in terms of conventional science. If that is the case, then we ought to get over our biases and study paranormal forces in the same way that we study any other part of the natural world. Alternatively, if in fact paranormal forces don't exist, we can learn a lot about human psychology from studying these experiences and trying to understand them. Now, when it comes to um, considering the field as a whole, I've not obviously got time to do a kind of a complete comprehensive review, so I'm going to focus on three phenomena that I feel have very direct implications for neuroscience. Um, but I would say that it's, I think it's fair to say that at the moment, parapsychologists, after well over a hundred years of research, have failed to convince the wider scientific community that 
telepathy really does exist, that precognition really does exist. And there's certainly nobody is anywhere near producing a neuroscientific model for how they might op actually operate if they do. So we'll park those to one side, and as I say, instead I'm going to focus on uh, two or three phenomena that I think have more direct implications for neuroscience. I want to start just by uh, briefly considering the, the mind-body problem, or the, the hard problem, as it's known within philosophy. Um, the hard problem is the question of how physical processes in the brain give rise to subjective experience. Uh, and this is a, this is a problem which ha philosophers have wrestled with for, for hundreds of years, and to date, no one has come up with a universally accepted solution to this problem. I think it's fair to say that most people are intuitive dualists. We tend to feel that um, the stuff that happens in our heads, our thoughts, our emotions, our subjective feelings, uh, mental imagery in the mind's eye, all of those kinds of things, are different sorts of things to tables, chairs, physical objects, um, including our own brains. They feel like they're kind of different kinds of stuff. So this very simple diagram kind of is an illustration of, of that basic idea. Obviously the idea um, was first formulated in, a, in any kind of serious form by René Descartes. Um, but the big problem here is how can the immaterial mind or soul or consciousness, whatever you want to call it, interact with the physical brain? How can the two interact with each other if one is said to be a physical thing and the other is said to be an immaterial thing? There have been various attempts to solve the problem. Uh, Descartes postulated that this interaction took place in the pineal gland. Uh, more recently, uh, Sir Karl Popper and Sir John Eccles, a famous philosopher and a famous neurophysiologist, postulated what they called interactive dualism, suggesting that there were maybe certain areas in the brain that were so sensitively poised that this immaterial mind could actually influence the physical brain. But in both cases, there was no proper explanation there. There was no explanation of how this could actually happen. Um, so, dualism, it, it, it's, it's problematic. In attempting to get around this problem, uh, some have gone for the other approach of saying, well, maybe dualism is wrong. Maybe there's only one kind of substance in the universe. Um, if you believe that everything is in fact mental, there's no, that the physical world out there is an illusion, in some ways. This is referred to as idealism. It's an example of a monist approach. Um, famously associated with Bishop George Barclay. But again, there are problems with this approach. As, as Susan Blackmore pointed out, it's very hard to understand, if this approach is correct, why physical objects seem to have enduring qualities that we can all agree upon, or indeed how science is possible at all. So maybe we'll try the other approach. We'll say if everything isn't mental, maybe everything is physical and the mental realm is, is in some way illusory. Um, so this would be materialism, all is matter. It comes in different varieties. There's identity theory that argues that mental states are literally identical to physical states. There's functionalism that equates mental states with, with functional states. Um, but you've still got this basic problem that mental states appear qualitatively to, to be different to patterns of neural activity. And so, again, people don't find this as a satisfying explanation. I'll mention one other approach before talking about the, um, the kind of uh, areas of parapsychology that are of relevance. Um, epiphenomenalism. This is the argument that mental states are indeed caused by physical changes in the brain, but they don't have any causal role to play. And this is a position that was argued first by Thomas Henry Huxley. Um, but suffice it to say that no one has to date come up with a solution to the hard problem that everybody looks at and says, yep, that makes sense, that's, that's that one sorted. Uh, and maybe they never will. I mean, I think it, 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 but we'll see, time will tell. I think it's fair to say that most neuroscientists tend to be materialists. They tend to assume that consciousness is entirely dependent upon the underlying physical structure of the brain and what's happening there. And they base that assumption on evidence from the effects of brain damage, the effects of brain stimulation, the effects of drugs on behaviour, perception, so on and so forth. Um, and there's also an assumption that consciousness cannot become separated from the living brain. Now, 
when we turn to parapsychology, there are certain phenomena um, which are reported which seem to question that assumption. So in particular, out-of-body experiences, um, near-death experiences, and any kind of post-mortem survival, any kind of life after death, must imply some radical form of dualism. If we're talking about kind of traditional religious beliefs, that people have an immortal soul that either goes up to heaven or goes down to hell, then again, there is something about the person that survives the physical death. If we're talking about reincarnation, we're talking about, again, some essence of the person that passes on from one physical body and brain into another. Um, so whichever version of life after death you consider, it must imply some radical form of dualism. Uh, and that, as I say, contradicts the traditional approach of most neuroscientists, I would suggest. So let's consider then uh, out-of-body experiences. Uh, usually we have a very strong sense of an embodied self. We feel as if our consciousness, if you ask most people, they report that they feel their consciousness is kind of somewhere behind the eyes looking out at the world around them. Um, an out-of-body experience refers to a temporary disruption of this, where people actually feel as if their consciousness has left their body. Um, it's sometimes, as in the illustration there, they may report that they, they're above themselves looking down and can actually see their physical bodies. Not always, sometimes the, the consciousness doesn't see the physical body. Um, but they do see the world from a different perspective. This is reported in all cultures. There are many, many historical accounts of out-of-body experiences, and it's abundant in folklore, mythology, spiritual experiences of ancient and modern societies. And it's a relatively common experience. Uh, it's estimated that around 10% of the population have, experience, have an out-of-body experience at least once in their lives. Now, there are a couple of possibilities. One is that this is a genuinely paranormal phenomenon, that we all have some kind of spirit, again, you might prefer the word consciousness or soul or whatever you want to call it, that can leave the physical body and it's capable of uh, sustaining consciousness so that you can see and hear events at remote locations from the physical body. Um, there's actually little evidence that directly supports that. Um, if that were the case, you might, for example, expect that people who can have out-of-body out experiences can accurately report the information they have picked up from remote locations, and it corresponds to what was actually going on at those locations at the time. Um, Although there's lots and lots of anecdotal accounts of people reporting that they were able to do this, most of them don't stand up to critical scrutiny. Um, there's also the possibility that if in some way the, the spirit was able to leave the physical body, it might be able to produce an effect at a distance. Even however slight, it might be able to influence what's happening at that distant location. Again, people, parapsychologists have produced studies that have tried to demonstrate this, and generally the effects have not been very convincing. Um, a lot of it, I will talk in more detail about near-death experiences, but obviously the out-of-body experience is one component of near-death experiences. <clears throat> I think there's a lot to be gained from thinking about um, out-of-body experiences in the non-near-death experience context. There are certain individuals who claim that they can have an out-of-body experience more or less at will by going through various mental exercises. Now, if that really were the case, we only need one of them, just one person who can reliably sit in this chair, have an out-of-body experience, and tell us what's happening in some remote location around the campus. That's all we need, just one. And yet, for all the claims that people have these abilities, we don't have that one person. I mean, that would immediately shut the sceptics up. That, that just completely flattens the idea that the mind cannot become separated from the physical brain. But there isn't one person who's ever been able to demonstrate that. Um, when we think about near-death experiences in clinical contexts, in the near-death experience, sorry, out-of-body experiences in the near-death experience context, you might be aware of various studies in hospitals that involve putting concealed targets high up on hospital wards in the hope, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, that someone will have a near-death experience while they're in the hospital 
and maybe their soul, their mind, their consciousness will float up above the target and it can then look down and report what this hidden target is. Um, I think that, I mean, it sounds like lots of people, it makes lots of people smile when they hear about these studies. I think it's a great idea. Uh, if anyone could ever come up with evidence that one of these targets had been identified, it would be a huge challenge to skeptics like me. Um, but to date, no one has managed that. And these studies now have been going on for many, many years. And to date, no one has actually managed that. Um, okay, so if, if the out-of-body experience isn't really what it feels like subjectively, then what other explanations might there be? Um, the obvious other explanation is that it's a hallucinatory experience, and it's based on a failure to integrate information from the different senses. Um, this embodied sense of self that we have depends on a combination of various senses. So proprioception, that's the awareness of your position in space. Uh, vestibular sensation, that tells us about balance and posture. Tactile information, the sense of touch. And uh, senses of the body's movements and visual input. And this is all integrated together to give this embodied self, sense of self. Um, the brain imposes coherence on this when the information is all uh, integrated together and any kind of minor inconsistencies that might be due to noise in the system or, any, or other kind of slight anomalies would be diminished and played down. But sometimes you can get inconsistent information from some sources that is very strong and cannot be ignored. Um, now we know we can actually modify the perception of uh, this embodied self in various ways in response to discrepant information. I assume that many of you are familiar with the rubber hand illusion, for example. Um, it's relatively easy to induce unusual bodily perceptions uh, by um, giving false visual input. With the rubber hand illusion, there is, as you can see in the setup there, um, the, person, a, the person's real hand is underneath a, uh, a surface so they can't see it, and a rubber hand is on top. And if uh, the same tactile sensations are induced in the, uh, in the real hand, as are indicated with the rubber hand, by gently stroking it, uh, people feel the rubber hand is their hand. And if you, I mean, very often one of the favourite tricks of um, more sadistic psychologists is to suddenly bring out a hammer and smash the rubber hand down, uh, and you can see that the kind of arousal levels of the people go, go way off the, the, surf, off the uh, scale because they feel, they, they perceive that as a physical threat to their own hand, even though in fact it clearly isn't. Now you can even take this kind of idea further. Um, recent uh, studies using virtual reality technology um, basically provide input from another perspective to the, to the subject and you can induce the uh, illusion in people that they're actually inhabiting another body uh, or even um, a, a mannequin um, and then again if you've, if you've managed to achieve this effect if you then suddenly stab the mannequin you get this kind of a, a very very high arousal levels of, of the similar to what you find if the person themselves thought they were physically threatened there's all kinds of variations in this. In one of, one of the ones which I particularly like, you can actually produce the illusion that in someone's head that they are shaking hands with themselves, which is a, a very kind of weird idea. But this is all down to basically providing very strong discrepant input. And the brain, in an attempt to integrate the whole thing together, uh, the sense of where the self actually is, is removed from the physical, actual body and, and, and perceived to be somewhere else. Um, this takes place at the temporoparietal junction, the, the, the point where, where the, the area where the parietal lobe and the temporal lobes meet, and particularly it seems that the right hemisphere seems to be um, implicated in this. Um, the various sources of evidence to support this assertion, so damage to this area can, pr can produce out of body experiences. Um, sometimes temporal lobe epileptics report that just before they have a seizure, they, they have an out-of-body experience. And really interesting research by Olaf Blanke shows that sometimes you can actually produce an out-of-body experience at the flick of a switch, essentially. So direct cortical stimulation in a 43-year-old woman who uh, was suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy um, showed that um, in initially the reports were of things like she felt that she was sinking into the bed or falling from a height. 
Uh, and, and then ultimately, as the, as a, as the kind of simulation was increased, I see myself lying in bed from above, but I only see my legs and lower trunk. And I think the fact that you can induce these sensations by that direct stimulation is very strong evidence that we're dealing with a hallucinatory experience. Uh, so there's an illustration of the same uh, basic notion. Um, stimulation here on, on one hemisphere is producing the outer body experience and interestingly the same area on, when stimulated on the other hemisphere is producing a very strong sense of presence uh, which again is an interesting kind of potential ostensibly paranormal experience. Um, there's also a, connect, a suggestion that the posterior visual pathways might be uh, implicated um, uh, so participants who uh, experience near-death experiences were worse at a perspective switching task, which was meant to measure uh, frontoparietal connectivity, um, and that may indicate that, there's a, that in those people there's a failure to maintain the appropriate sense of embodied self. Um, Okay, um, and also, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to talk about this in any great detail, but there are obviously psychological traits that are related to the tendency to have near-death experiences. Uh, things like absorption, um, people who score higher on measures of absorption are, are more likely to have an out-of-body experience while meditating, for example, um, and facilitates relaxation and external direction of attention. Okay, so I've talked about out-of-body experiences at, at, in some detail. Um, it's one component of the near-death experience. I'm going to talk about near-death experience in, in a little bit more detail now. Near-death experiences uh, sometimes occur in people who are either close to death or even people who just think they are close to death, even though objectively they're not. 3% um, of Americans claim to have had a near-death experience, and it's estimated to occur in uh, between 9 and 18% of people who are close to death. Is that one population that have been studied a lot are cardiac arrest survivors. Um, the advantage here is that if you have people who've had a cardiac arrest and they're, they're there in hospital, you can interview them very soon after they recover, um, hopefully within a, within a day or two. And so if they have had one of these experiences, there's less possibility that their memory will have become distorted. Um, in, in the early days, all the NDE research tended to be retrospective, and sometimes the reports were coming from 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, so it's much better to kind of get in there while the memory is, is fresh. Uh, although there is research to say that the, um, re the reports of near-death experiences do remain stable over time. Uh, so Bruce Grayson, for example, has produced evidence saying that over two decades, the uh, reports don't seem to change that much. There's no universally accepted definition of what a near-death experience is. There are a number of features which appear quite commonly, but it's, I don't think it's ever been reported that someone's had an experience with all of these different components. Um, but Kenneth Ring identifies a number of core experiences. Uh, he said there were five stages, typically, to a near-death experience, and they tended to occur in the following order. So the first thing was a, a, an overwhelming sense of peace and, well, <coughs> excuse me, and well-being. This was reported by 60% of his sample. Um, and they report a positive emotional tone. It, it feels really, really good. Um, however, um, later research did establish that sometimes people have negative near-death experiences. Um, and obviously these can be very, very distressing. There seems to be three different um, subtypes of negative near-death experience. In one, the basic phenomenology is the same as for the positive experience, with the one exception that the person who is having the experience thinks, oh my God, this means I'm dead, and they're not very happy about it. But in terms of what they're actually experiencing, the out-of-body experience, all those other things, that is very, very similar. The second type is interesting because it's a kind of um, Hieronymus Bosch type vision of hell, literally, with demons, people being roasted over uh, fires, demons with pitchforks, the whole thing. And people have the experience say it's really weird because it seems like some kind of pantomime, it doesn't seem real, but that's what they experience. And the third one is the one that really sends a chill down my spine, 
It's the experience that you are in a void, a featureless void, absolute emptiness. You're on your own and you're going to be there forever. And that really, really is a, is a chilling prospect. Um, now, not surprisingly, uh, people who have that experience often end up suffering from post-traumatic stress as a result. Um, so the second, the second component is separation from the physical body, the outer body experience, in other words. This was reported in 37% of rings sample. Half of those people saw their own body from a different vantage point, and obviously therefore half didn't. Um, entering a transitional region of darkness, this was reported in a quarter of the sample, and it's sometimes described as, as tunnel-like. People often report this experience of going down a tunnel towards a bright light. This brilliant light does not hurt the eyes. This was reported by 16% of the sample, and people feel as if they're being drawn towards the light. And typically it's perceived as being some spiritual being, depending on the religious beliefs of the person. It might be God, or Jesus, or whatever. Um, and this stage may involve a panoramic life review. People literally, I mean, this is, you know, it's not, it's not a myth. This actually does happen. Uh, people report their life flashing before their eyes. And they, 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 different episodes in their lives where they've had an impact on other people's lives. It's all kind of, this life review is, is felt to be non-judgmental, but people feel as if they're learning from it. Um, and uh, towards the end of the experience, uh, for those that get that far, um, people often report entering another realm. Um, it might be a beautiful garden with heavenly music off some fantastic city, but wherever it is, this place is absolutely stunningly beautiful beyond description. They may encounter deceased relatives or other spiritual guides, and there may be some kind of natural border that they come to. It might be a fence or a gate or a river, um, but at that point they have to make the decision. Either they're told that their time has not yet come and they must go back, or they might make the decision themselves. I mean, someone might feel, even though they really want to stay in this beautiful place, they've got responsibilities. They want, for example, to, to, to raise their children, so they must go back. Uh, and they're often very kind of upset to do that, um, the decision is then made to return to the body. Now, near-death experiences, as you might imagine, can have very profound and long-lasting effects. Um, most people, as I said before, do report that the NDE is a positive experience, but even for those people who report a positive experience, they can sometimes have difficulties dealing with life afterwards. Um, on the positive side, they report that they feel less materialistic, more spiritual, less competitive. Uh, there's a decreased fear of life after death. They become essentially saint-like. Um, this can cause problems. There's a very high divorce rate amongst NDE sufferers. Uh, because you can imagine that if your partner comes home and says, right, I've sold the house and given all the money to charity. That might be a great, <laughs> really good act, but it might not make you very happy. You might not be able to live with the saint. Um, and also there can be negative after effects. Um, one of the common factors is people report it's very difficult to describe the experience, particularly to other people who haven't had it. Um, and so that can be frustrating. And there's obviously a fear of ridicule. Sometimes people think if they talk about this experience, people will think they're crazy. Unfortunately, that's decreasing the more awareness people have that this is a real, a real phenomenon. Um, Despair at returning to the ordinary world, having experienced this amazing, blissful place, and as I say, difficulty with relationships. Um, obviously, the effects of the negative near death experiences are worse, whereas the positive experiences decrease the fear of death. If you've had one of these negative experiences, you become even more frightened of the prospect of dying. There might be flashbacks and post traumatic stress disorder. So, again, We've got the possible explanations. Is a near-death experience what it seems to be to the people who have them? It's a genuinely paranormal experience. The soul leaves the body. It perhaps provides evidence of an afterlife. Um, on the positive side, in support of that idea, there are lots of reports of people who could apparently accurately, accurately report what was going on while they were having their near-death experience. So maybe they report what was going on in the operating theatre while well, there were attempts being made to uh, revive them and so on and so forth. Um, there are alternative explanations. Again, I don't have time to go into detail on this, but there are alternative explanations here. Um, Susan Blackmore suggests that these accounts may be out-of-body experiences, hallucinatory experiences, 
based on prior knowledge, information available at the time. I mean, one thing we know that happens more than we would like is that people sometimes regain consciousness while they're undergoing an operation. And the first sense to come back would be hearing. And obviously what might happen in this situation is because you can hear what's going on around you, you know in general terms the kinds of things that happen in operating theatre, you, you form a mental image uh, and, and that's, you then take that as being reality. Um, uh, information available at the time, fantasy or dreams, lucky guesses, selective memory for correct details, and just the tendency to tell a good story. Now, um, one or two near-death experience researchers, in fact more than that, um, do make the claim that um, NDEs are a major challenge to modern neuroscience. So I'll give you a couple of uh, quotations to illustrate that. Pim van Lommel, for example, and colleagues wrote, how could a clear consciousness outside one's body be experienced at the moment when the brain no longer functions during a period of clinical death with flat EEG? And Santania and Peter Fennick wrote, the occurrence of lucid, well-structured thought processes together with reasoning, attention and memory recall of specific events during a cardiac arrest raise a number of interesting and perplexing questions regarding how such experiences could arise. These experiences appear to be occurring at a time when cerebral function can be described at best as severely impaired and at worst absent. Now, these are very strong claims that are being made here uh, and they, they have been repeated and are being repeated a lot um, but there are lots of questions that, that, that are, be, are being left open here. For one thing, we don't know when the near-death experience is actually occurring. There is always the possibility that a near-death experience is occurring in the, uh, before the person loses consciousness or as they more slowly regain consciousness. The, the objection is sometimes made that that can't be the case because the near-death experience feels like it's going on for a long time. But as we know, altered states of consciousness can distort time perception. And this is illustrated by the near-death experience itself, the life review process that takes place, where people feel that their whole life is being reviewed in, in a fraction of a second. So we don't know when the actual near-death experience is actually taking place. There are other criticisms of these kinds of claims. Mark Chrislip wrote, uh, having your heart stop for two to ten minutes and being promptly resuscitated doesn't make you clinically dead. It only means your heart isn't beating and you, and you may not be conscious. I think Jason Braithwaite has produced the most <coughs> comprehensive critique of these kinds of claims. Um, in particular, he points out these claims are based on over-reliance on the power of surface EEG to uh, indicate brain activity within different regions of the brain. Um, isoelectric surface EEG recordings, or flatlining as it's referred to, isn't necessarily an indication of total brain inactivity. There might still be activity at deeper brain levels, such as the amygdala and the hippocampus. And uh, Law 1986 produced evidence suggesting that complex and meaningful hallucinations can be generated by discharges in these areas without the involvement of any cortical activity. Uh, Toa et al. Uh, present convincing data to show that high amplitude seizure activity may be taking place in deep brain regions but be undetectable by surface EEG recordings. And even more uh, damaging for this claim, Kobayashi et al, uh, in a study comparing the fMRI bold response with surface EEG recordings, showed that surface EEG could sometimes even fail to detect seizure activity that was taking place at the cortex. So clearly, these generalizations, these, these claims are being made on the basis of kind of very flimsy <coughs> evidence. And to my knowledge, the people making the claims have just not commented on the critiques that have been made. They've just totally ignored them as if they've never been made, which is uh, worrying. Um, okay, so if the paranormal explanations are not correct, what are the non-paranormal uh, explanation? I mean, the non-paranormal explanation is, again, just to remind you, based on the notion that consciousness totally depends on physical brain function, as supported by evidence from brain damage, brain stimulation, and drugs. Um, aspects of near and it, one thing to bear in mind is that the different components of the near death experience do occur in other contexts. And sometimes in these other contexts, we can get a better uh, grasp of what might be going on in the brain that might cause these hallucinatory experiences. 
Um, so I'll give you a few examples of that. Oxygen deprivation, or similarly a, um, a, a build-up of carbon dioxide in the blood, can cause very similar sensations to that, those which are reported during a near-death experience. Um, Winnery reports results from a study of what's called G-lock, that's gravity-induced loss of consciousness. Um, G-lock can occur in uh, fighter pilots when they undergo extreme manoeuvres that produce G-forces that mean that their blood cannot actually get to their brain and they can pass out. Um, and this could, just to reassure you, this can be studied in the laboratory in a, in a machine like this. You've probably seen this where they put pilots in and they whiz them around at very, very high speeds and they will lose consciousness because the, the blood cannot get to the brain. And this is the kind of study which uh, Winnery carried out, I think about a thousand pi uh, pilots. Uh, and lack of oxygen to the brain produces things like tunnel vision, bright lights, floating sensations, outer body experiences, vivid dreamlets of beautiful places, pleasurable sensations, euphoria and dissociation, and the inclusion of family and friends. Now, this is very similar to what's reported during an out-of-body experience. Generally, there is no life review, and there are no transformative long-term after-effects, but this may be due to the context. These people do not believe, when they're being whizzed around, that they're actually going to die. They know they might pass out, they don't think they're going to die, so that context may explain why you don't get the life review and the long-term transformative after effects. Um, having said that, this can't be a full explanation because we know that some people experience near-death uh, NDEs without anoxia. And Susan Blackmore, for one, and, and others, are very clear that uh, oxygen deprivation is only one possible cause. She would emphasise uh, cortical disinhibition as being the main factor, but that can be produced by other means than just oxygen deprivation. That's just one way in which it can be produced. Uh, a number of people have attempted to explain components of their near-death experience um, in terms of neurotransmitters. So, for example, endorphins that are released in times of stress reduce pain and um, induce a blissful emotional state. Um, so that might account for the kind of general, generally positive emotional tone of near-death experiences. There are one or two interesting, albeit anecdotal, accounts of people reporting that they were having a very positive near-death experience that suddenly turned into a nightmarish experience. And it turned out that at the time when the, the change occurred, as far as you can assess, um, they had been injected with naloxone, which would actually inhibit endorphins. Um, more so suggested that serotonin may be involved in mystical hallucinations and out-of-body experiences, and the effects of ketamine are known to uh, resemble near-death experiences. So there's an argument that there may sometimes get a similarly uh, naturally occurring chemical in the brain. Having said that, this has never been found. Um, we know, again, just to go back to the temporal lobe, the temporal lobe seems to be uh, involved in these kinds of experiences. Um, damage or stimulation produces some NDE-like effects, as I've already said, out-of-body experiences, hallucinations, memory flashbacks, or at least apparent memory flashbacks. There is a question mark over whether they are genuine memory flashbacks. Um, uh, sensitivity to anoxia in the temporal lobe, and individuals who've had near-death experiences showed more temporal lobe leptiform activity than a non-ND control group. There was a slight problem, it was interesting, there was a slight problem with the study, the control group that should have been used, really, were people who had come close to death but hadn't had an NDE, rather than just uh, people who hadn't come close to death. Now, okay, that's all I'm going to say about near-death experiences. I'm keeping an eye on the time, because I know we started a bit late, so we have not gone too long. Um, now I'm going to try and share, I'm going to go, go so we've talked about out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, the final thing I want to talk about is sleep paralysis, but I don't want to talk about it too much because I'm sure you're fed up of, uh, well actually you're going to hear my voice anyway, um, I'm going to try and show you a film, but I tried this before and it didn't work so I think I might need to come out of PowerPoint, oh no I don't, <laughs> right. Watch the film. Enjoy. I'll explain it later. My bed was shaking, and I felt like I was being strangled. The only thing I could with my eyes, but I just felt like there was a presence in my room. It kind of had its own yeah. consciousness. Pressure Dark. holding me down, Rushing. screaming and screaming and asking for help, but your mouth isn't moving. I started to cry out to Jesus, and I couldn't even say his name. I said, 
Yeah. And next thing I know, there's, there's this woman on top of me. There was a woman who was in bed next to me. She looked dead. Ever since records began, there have been stories told of people being attacked during the night by nocturnal monsters or demons or spirits. These accounts have led to all kinds of myths and legends and, and, and beliefs about strange beings. This is the Boto. By day, a pink river dolphin of the Amazon, the Boto transforms nightly into a libidinous human-shaped prowler. Wearing a hat to disguise the breathing hole on top of his head, this notorious demon attacks sleepers in their beds. This bear-like creature, the Tukunoshi, is known to roam regions of Africa, impregnating women and biting off the toes of men and children under the cover of sleep. Very often people report that these kind of grotesque, monstrous figures will slowly approach them and then often will actually try to drop them. Them. The old hag of Newfoundland. Legend describes how she comes in the night and sits astride her sleeping victims, crushing the breath from their bodies. I think there's actually an alternative explanation. I think we're dealing there with the phenomenon of sleep paralysis. Back in the Middle Ages, the same court experience was interpreted as being attacked by sex-crazed demons. Lots of accusations of witchcraft were based on sleep paralysis, and what's very common now is that people will interpret episodes in that actually uh, they have been abducted by aliens. Anything that disturbs your sleep pattern makes it more likely to happen, so your anxiety about having a sleep paralysis attack means that you find it difficult to sleep, which means that when you do sleep, you're more likely to have one. In its most basic form, and by that I mean half awake, half asleep, and not being able to move, between 20 and 40 percent of the population report they've had that at least once in their lives. A smaller proportion, about 5 percent of the population, get associated symptoms, things like a sense of presence, hallucinations, pressure on the chest and difficulty breathing, and there's intense fear. During a normal sleep cycle, you go into a REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the phase of sleep that's typically associated with vivid dreaming. When you're in that state, the muscles of your body are actually paralysed to stop you acting out the actions of the dream. What happens in sleep paralysis is your mind is working it, but your body hasn't. So you can't move, but you're aware of your surroundings. On top of that, the kind of dream imagery comes through into normal waking consciousness, so that you get this altered state. Into. I am awake! Uh, 
very well-renowned psychiatrist told me that I was having psychotic episodes with possible seizures. And he put me on an antipsychotic, and um, I took those drugs for like three years. Of course, they didn't help because that wasn't what was wrong with me. You're not going crazy, you're not going to touch my spirits, you're not going to touch my organs. It's a physiological effect, it's a, a very vivid, hallucinatory experience. It's not real. It's a matter if it's real. Because it feels real. And that's what matters, isn't it? What feels real is what really matters, isn't it? What really matters is what's real to you. Like the feeling you get that someone is walking behind you in the dark. Experiences. Um, uh, it's supported by the Wellcome Trust. And if you want to find out, if you want to watch the film again, or if you want to find out more about sleep paralysis, uh, it's just use the website called the Sleep Paralysis Project. So if you type that into Google, it'll take you straight to the website, and you can show your friends. What she said she wanted to do was to produce something that was uh, part science documentary and part horror film, and I, I think she, <laughs> she succeeded very well. Um, uh, now, I mean, the, the thing about sleep paralysis, whereas with uh, out-of-body experiences and near-death experiences, they give the experiencer the impression that their own consciousness has left their physical body, obviously that raises the possibility that there might be other spiritual beings out there, ghosts, uh, demons, um, gods, whatever, angels, and this... Sleep paralysis is a, a situation where people feel they have actually experienced those, those other beings. So that's why I've included that in the talk. So just to say a little bit more about sleep paralysis, one thing uh, that I sh well, I should correct in, in, the, in the commentary for the film there, I actually said that somewhere between um, 20 and 40% of the population say they've experienced it at least once. I will have to correct that in a, in a second. Um, sleep paralysis... It tends to occur more likely if you, are, if you have the underlying susceptibility, if you are lying on your back rather than any other position when you're asleep, if you're in unfamiliar surroundings, and if your sleep pattern has been disrupted. So if you work night shifts, if you have jet lag, if you are uh, a mother with a crying baby, any of those things that will disrupt your sleep pattern make it more likely you might have an episode. It typically lasts between a few seconds and a few minutes, and it may actually be repeated several times in the night. So this can be really awful for people who suffer. They, they wake, they manage to come around to proper con full consciousness, having had a terrifying experience, and then they drift back into sleep, and it happens again, maybe up to a dozen times in one night. And you also sometimes get false awakenings. People think they have woken up, um, and think that the, the kind of awful experiences are behind them, and then something weird happens and they realise they're still asleep, which again can be uh, quite dis disconcerting. Now I mentioned uh, that the, the uh, incidence rates 
seem to vary enormously depending on the study and the particular population that are being studied. I'm not going to read all these out, but you can see there that uh, estimates range from, say, 5% to 62%. Um, and similarly, here's another. Uh, this, this is a more recent study by a friend of mine, Brian Sharpless, who did a big meta-analysis. Um, 35 studies with a total sample of 36,500. And it actually turns out that the rate in the general population is around about 8%, 7.6%. Uh, however, there are two exceptions to this, and that's psychiatric patients and students, <laughs> who both show rates of around 30%. Of course, the one thing they have in common is disruptive sleep patterns. Um, so that might be the explanation there. Interestingly, having said that, as I said, for years I was saying that oh, it's around 30%. This was based on testing our own incoming first-year students, so that would correspond to the figure there. But recently, two fairly large studies of the general population in the UK have both shown incidence rates around the 30% mark. So it might be there are genuine differences between countries, or it might be some other explanation. But anyway, I just thought I'd raise that. Um, in terms of trying to understand what's going on, uh, EEG evidence, in the mid-1900s it was suggested that sleep paralysis was a form of epilepsy uh, because of certain features that it shares with an epileptic seizure, but subsequent investigations have conclusively ruled this out. It's not a form of epilepsy. There are no epileptic discharges during episodes of sleep paralysis. And polysomnograph recordings show that the patterns of activity during sleep paralysis are similar to those found during normal REM sleep. And as you'll be aware, REM, rapid eye movement sleep, is the phase of sleep that's typically associated with vivid dreaming. So the idea is that, um, again, as I said in the film, to put it simply, it's as though your brain wakes up, but your body doesn't. And so you can see that you're in your bedroom. You can move your eyes. That's the one part of the body you can still move. You can see you're in your bedroom, you can't move, and then you may get all this weird dream injury coming through into normal waking consciousness, and the results can be a terrifying episode of sleep paralysis. Um, during the normal sleep cycle, you go through various uh, stages of non-REM sleep, where your heart rate changes, your brain, breathing rate, your brain activity. These cycles last, this takes about 60 to 90 minutes, and then the cycle reverses, and you go into REM sleep for about 10 to 15 minutes, as I say, associated with vivid dreaming, and during this phase, your muscles are actually paralysed, presumably to stop you acting out the actions of the dream. Um, you then typically go back into stage 2 sleep, and the cycle continues in kind of about 90 minute cycles throughout the night. Each cycle, so it takes about 90 minutes, the early stages of early sleep is dominated by stage three and four sleep, but towards the end, stage four sleep shortens and REM extends. Um, now, sleep paralysis, as I said, can be considered an intrusion of REM sleep characteristics into wakefulness. The muscles are paralysed. You get associated hallucinations, um, and particularly, sleep paralysis episodes are characterised by what are called sudden, uh, sorry, sleep onset REM periods. If you go straight into REM, rather than going through the other non-REM phases first, as illustrated by the red line in this diagram, then if you have the underlying susceptibility, you are more likely to actually have a sleep paralysis episode. Okay, uh, I'll draw things to a close there, because we we're a bit late starting. Um, so just by way of conclusion, um, these anomalous experiences, things like out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, sleep paralysis, there are only three examples. There are other examples that we could have considered. Um, these are reported in all known societies. They, they often reinforce supernatural beliefs. Uh, but I would argue that neuropsychology potentially at least provides more plausible explanations and, importantly, testable explanations. So taking these experiences seriously can provide insights into the true nature of consciousness. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Uh, it's a really, really nice talk. Um, we have now 15 minutes for questions, and I hope answers. Uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you have answers. Uh, any, if you raise your hand, I will bring you the microphone. One, come on. <laughs> Oh, 
you very much. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, I have just a comment. Uh, I think it was really, really interesting. Uh, I have a comment on uh, patients of uh, temporal lobe epilepsy and these experiences. I have read some papers in which uh, they have explored these experiences of these kind of patients through art. And these uh, papers were really, really interesting because uh, the patients would uh, draw these uh, go to the light uh, experiences, these out of the body experiences. So I think uh, that uh, we should, as, as you, you said, try to explore these uh, kind of experiences with open mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I think we are losing a lot of uh, uh, insight into these experiences if we uh, just dismiss them as uh, something that only crazy people experience. And uh, I mean, this is just, uh, uh, it's not kind of a, a question, but uh, can you um, uh, tell a little bit more on what we know about uh, this uh, epilepsy and uh, the contribution of epilepsy to this uh, experiences? I think you're quite right. I mean, it's really, really important to get those first-hand accounts and, and see what they can tell us. I mean, because, yeah, I mean, obviously, as uh, scientists, we like numbers. We like to be able to analyze things and do the stats and so on and so forth. But those rich, detailed, first-hand accounts, you really need those if you're going to get anywhere near understanding uh, what it feels like. And as I said before, one of the problems here is the kind of ineffability of the experience, the difficulty that people have in, in putting it into words. And so, you know, it is important that we pay attention to those, to those first-hand accounts. Um, there are all kinds of interesting suggestions about various mystical experiences that might be associated with temporal lobe epilepsy. I mean, Dostoevsky was, was famously a, a temporal lobe epileptic, and he he said that the, the feeling of mystical oneness with the universe that he had just preceding an attack, he wouldn't have swapped for anything. You know, it was, uh, it was just a kind of an amazing <laughs> transcendental experience for him. Um, and so obviously there, there's overlaps here with the whole psychology of religion. I mean, there, there's an argument that temporal low um, problems can sometimes be associated with people becoming hyper-religious. Um, and, and, you know, you look back historically at a number of famous religious characters, and the, I think you make a reasonable case that maybe they were suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy. Um, so yeah, I agree entirely with what you're saying there. Yeah, yeah you're right. Actually, uh, I have read about, I don't know, I mean, this can be a lot of speculation, but I have read a lot of Joan of Arc being uh, suffering from epileptic seizures, and that's why she heard all these uh, bells and all these stuff. I think we as scientists need to keep an eye on art, Absolutely. Because obviously yeah. we are losing a lot if we yeah. just look at the brain and that's it. Yeah. I mean, and also, I mean, I think just to follow up on that point, I mean, I think um, using art as a way of just raising awareness of the scientific issues, which I think, you know, we, we managed to do with the sleep paralysis project uh, very well. Um, but again, it's, I mean, it's always, it's always really nice doing those kind of sci-art collaborations because you get a different perspective. You know, we're used to the same scientific perspective, but to actually see it from through someone else's eyes is, is always useful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for your talk. It's been really amusing. My attitude in, in the beginning was uh, I'm quite accepting about everything uh, and especially about this. Uh, and I, I was like, uh, when you face uh, playing chess, it's really funny sometimes but useless. So sometimes you think, why I should put some effort in understanding this when this is just a step? But even so, I, I, I think that your talk has uh, put uh, several questions that are very interesting to me, and I would like you to know your opinion. The first one is that it is not so, I mean, it is interesting to understand why these kind of experiences happen, uh, and uh, the mechanistic and neurological substrate of it, but also why people need of such a kind of experience. Mm -hmm. Why it yeah. is so pervasive, because uh, people really want to have these experiences and they have some benefit for them. Uh, and and this, uh, this is interesting in itself. 
And the second thing is more neurological or neuroscientist, uh, is that many of these experiences can be interpreted as a kind of dreams. For instance, uh, the, the, this kind of out of body experiences or uh, death experiences of these kind of things. Uh, and maybe the main problem is that we ignore everything about dreams as neuroscientists. I mean, we suspect that they occur during uh, REM uh, states, but this has never been proved really. I mean, this, this, this statement is found here and there, but nobody has proven uh, properly. Uh, and, and obviously, we ignore absolutely everything about the activity of the brain while learning. Uh, uh, and maybe well, we know that during REM stage there is some enhanced activity of the temporal lobe and some part of the uh, frontal lobe and so on. But but this doesn't demonstrate that this has to do with dreaming. Is we I'm not sure that uh, dreaming of course ex exclusively and all the time while in REM stage. So uh, this is an, a very interesting question that should be. I, I know we all, all the neuroscientists should uh, pay attention to. And I, I mean, I thank you for, because this is something that I have thought just after your talk. But okay, yeah, now, um, I mean, yeah, with respect to your first point, um, I mean, yes, it's certainly the case that some people actively seek these kinds of experiences. Um, even, there are even people who seek the sleep paralysis type experiences, um, which, and again, I, I kind of committed a certain minor sin there, insofar as um, I refer to kind of negative near-death experiences only. And there is a subset of positive, uh, sorry, look, cancel. Uh, I refer to negative sleep paralysis experiences only, and there is an interesting subset of positive sleep paralysis experiences. They're very similar in many ways to the negative ones, except they have a positive emotional valence. And uh, I, I mean, I strongly suspect, although I've not had the time to look at this in any, in any detail, that various kind of historical accounts of angelic encounters might be examples of positive sleep paralysis experiences. I mean, you've certainly got the, the sense of kind of awe and wonder and kind of the, the overwhelmingness of the whole experience, and yet it's seen as being something positive, this being that has suddenly appeared in your bedroom, you know. Um, but yes, people seek out all of these kinds of experiences, either through kind of mental exercises or through, the, the quick way, taking drugs. <laughs> and, uh, and, and clearly people feel, you know, we talk about kind of um, mind-expanding Drugs, you know, um, people feel that they've actually gained something from these kinds of experiences. So, so that in itself is interesting, and, and obviously, and kind of as, as, as I kind of mentioned, comparing the actual characteristics of those experiences with naturally occurring ones like near-death experiences and so on, sleep paralysis, to to find the, the similarities and the differences. Um, I think, in terms of uh, why these kinds of experiences are um, so important, it, it's because it reinforces our desire for life after death, basically. Um, you know, m virtually everyone, I think, if they're honest, is uh, worried about the prospect of death. <laughs> and uh, not only do we not like the idea that when our physical body dies, that that's the end of us. I think we particularly don't like the idea that when our loved ones die, that's it. We'll never have any contact with them again. So we want to be leaving life after death. And I think the single most pervasive and powerful cognitive bias that we all suffer from is confirmation bias. So any evidence that supports something that we already want to be true doesn't necessarily have to be that strong for us to accept it. Um, and so, you know, that, that's the kind of, you know, the emotional motivation for why we want to believe these things. We've also got another, I, I would argue, a number of other cognitive biases as a result of our evolutionary history um, that also tend to push us towards believing in the idea of, of spirits. Um, so just to give you, you know, a couple of examples, um, 
we, we tend to have what's called an intentionality bias, or sometimes Michael Shermer calls it agenticity. The, we have a kind of default setting that whenever anything happens in the world, it happens because someone or something wanted it to happen, made it happen. Um, and, and in evolutionary terms, that kind of is a good bias to have because you're less likely to get uh, killed by some kind of external uh, threat, be it a wild animal or some enemy. Um, but we kind of overplay it, as, as, as is often the case, so that um, yeah, the idea that if there's a flood or a, a thunderstorm or something, that is, that's the gods who are, who are causing that. Um, and it's not too far then to believe in other external, invisible, spiritual beings. So there's all kinds of reasons that, you know, the, the way the brain's wired is pushing us to all of these kinds of beliefs anyway. Um, with respect to dreams, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's so much kind of speculation and theorising about what, what are dreams, why do we dream? And no one knows, is the short answer. Um, I think we can be pretty confident that some of the theories that have been put forward, and in particular I would single out psychoanalytic theories, are what we technically refer to as bullshit. Um, but, but beyond that, you know, we seem to have a physiological need for dreams, and yet we don't know why. We really don't know why. And yet, you know, for, for all of us, I mean, you know, I was, I was kind of sleeping in an unfamiliar bedroom last night, and I had some very, very interesting and weird dreams, and, you know, it's such a common, obviously a common experience for us to go off into this other world where... Certainly, our minds are not working in the way they normally would. You know, we never ask ourselves, "How did I? How did I get onto this high precipice with no way down?" We never think about that. We just work. You know, we just find ourselves there, and it's, our whole logic is, is is different. So, yeah, we need to learn a lot more about about why we dream, what dreams are for, if anything, are they just some kind of random byproduct of other activity? Uh, but I don't think that we're anywhere near a definitive answer on that one yet, yeah, sadly. One last question. She's near. Hello, first of all, thank you for the question talk. Thank you. Uh, in, now, uh, there is a theory, very famous theory, that uh, consciousness is all this kind of universal energy that it's all around us. But then there is the, the theory of that it's all neurological. So what's the relation uh, between these two theories? Well, again, I mean, there are some interesting ideas around. Uh, I was talking to Angelo yesterday about Rupert Sheldrake, who has some very interesting ideas about morphic fields. Are you familiar with, with his work? He, he, he has this... He puts forward the notion, basically, that um, basically modern neuroscience is wrong in that fundamental assumption. The fundamental assumption being that consciousness is entirely a product of what's going on in our own physical brains. And he talks more in terms of fields that extend beyond the physical brain and can interact with other fields. And he puts forward this uh, idea as an explanation for telepathy and, and various other ostensibly paranormal phenomena. Um, my own feeling is that, to date, I have not seen any evidence that I feel is powerful and compelling enough to make me feel that we need to abandon the fundamental assumption of neuroscience that consciousness is entirely dependent on what happens within the physical brain. Now, it might turn out that that is wrong. Um, it could, it could in, in principle, be proven to be wrong. Uh, and I think that, in terms of what I've been talking about, the, the component that we really should concentrate on is the uh, out-of-body experience. If, as I said in the talk, if we could find just one person who could have an out-of-body experience, more or less at will, and then report back to us on information in remote locations accurately, that would be the end of the argument. There'd be no question then that yes, consciousness really can leave the physical body, so to speak. Um, but despite lots of claims to that effect, going back hundreds of years, 
so far, nobody has actually been able to do that. Um, but yeah, I think that would be... Sorry, go on. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same organization that you mentioned, but uh, that, that pays out the money calls to someone who can demonstrate this kind of thing. Who, who is? Uh, I don't know how it, it is said, but uh, this organization you, you said before, uh, it's the one that pays out the money to someone that can do okay. the Okay, it's another million dollar challenge, around Jake Yeah, it's probably, it's probably. I mean, there, are, there, are, there is money on offer. There are, there, there are many cash prizes on offer for anyone who can demonstrate a paranormal phenomenon under properly controlled conditions. And one of the most famous examples is uh, James Randi's one million dollar challenge. And that was going for, very, for many, many years, as I say, for anybody who could actually uh, demonstrate paranormal phenomenon under properly controlled conditions. And of course, no one ever succeeded. Randi did insist that before going for the million dollar formal test, uh, any claimants would have to go for a, a, a preliminary test carried out by people that he knows and trusts. And so we ended up carrying out many of those preliminary tests. And of course, the claimants never get past the preliminary test stage, so Randy doesn't have to do any work. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but there are still those, there are many offers around, but for anybody who can do this, uh, so if any of you feel you have this ability, <laughs> let us know. You know. I'll just take ten percent. I'm not a greedy man. <laughs> okay, so uh, the organizers were talking mentally to give you a VAP pass to invite you all these years to this event. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Uh, you have now, I think, what time is it? Okay, we have uh, like twenty minutes to have a coffee and wake up. Uh, uh, see you at uh, 11. Okay? Okay, Ed, remember, if you want the certificate, you need to sign. You can listen to the and you get to mark the hoja de firma. We can clap. Uh,
vistas de la cola que se forma eh, una firma por la mañana, una por la tarde y ya está, ¿vale? Y ya, ya, ya os defiendo yo de cara a... <risa> Yeah, 